This presentation is on Wyatt, Surrey, Henry Howard, and the Renaissance Sonnet. We'll start by talking about Wyatt. A lot of the, the portraits, these wonderful portrait drawings in this presentation are by uh, the artist Hans Holbein, who did lots of portraits of uh, people associated with the court of Henry VIII. So Thomas Wyatt was born at Allington Castle in uh, Kent, so um, southeast part of England. His father, Henry, uh, was a member of the Privy Council of the first Tudor king, Henry VII, and later was also a counselor to King Henry VIII. So, so Thomas Wyatt was, was born into uh, privilege and uh, had close associations with the Tudor court um, from, from very early in his life. Uh, he would later uh, um, have uh, write, write poems uh, about Kent um, particularly after he was exiled from the court in 1536. He was sent to Kent, kind of put under uh, sort of a house arrest. Um, and he talks about Kent and, and, and feeling a kind of freedom or release from uh, the high pressure world of uh, the court of King Henry VIII. And he talks about this in... Um, in his poem my own john poins um, and this also comes up in some of his some of his shorter lyrics uh, primarily stand who so list uh, where he talks about um, how dangerous it is to be a courtier in 1524 wyatt begins his service uh, to the king as a royal ambassador and he goes on a number of diplomatic trips to Spain, France, and the Netherlands. Important, an important role for him early in his life. In 1527, he travels to Rome to help petition Pope uh, Clement VII to annul King Henry VIII's marriage to Catherine of Aragon. Uh, we know that this failed, of course, uh, but perhaps around this time, uh, he starts reading the Italian poet Petrarch and begins writing poems of his own that show Italian influence. Uh, holograph copies of Wyatt's poems, that is, um, uh, poems written in, in Wyatt's own hand, appear in the Edgerton manuscript, which you see on the left. That's the most important of the manuscripts containing Wyatt's poems, but there are copies not in his handwriting, uh, but poems by him that appear in various other documents. Uh, another important one is the Devonshire Manuscript, and there are several others that contain his poems. Um, but very few uh, of his poems actually appeared in print in his lifetime. Mostly they circulated in manuscript. Fifteen thirty-six. This is an important year for Wyatt. He is he falls out of favor with the king and is imprisoned in the Tower of London. He's accused of having an affair with the king's second wife Anne Boleyn, um, and most scholars think that his sonnet "Who So List to Hunt" um, alludes to this uh, relationship. Um, and also, while he was in prison there. He probably watched from his cell as Anne and several of her lovers were executed, had their heads chopped off. And in fact, um, one of his uh, poems, uh, Stand Who So List, um, is about this experience, or seems to be about this experience. Uh, the conclusion of the poem is, is that if you associate with powerful people, um, you are putting yourself in danger um, of having your head land in a basket. He wound up um, being exiled to Kent, as I said earlier at this time. Uh, he was not killed. Um, and 
this is largely owing to um, his family connections to uh, the king's chief minister, Thomas Cromwell, probably saved his life. There's Thomas Cromwell, another portrait by Holbein. From 1537 to 1539, Wyatt serves as an ambassador to the Holy, Holy Roman Emperor Charles V in Spain. Um, during this time, uh, his patron, Thomas Cromwell, who, who probably got him out of the Tower of London in 1536, falls out of favor with Henry VIII, um, and he gets executed, and a lot of that has to do with Henry VIII's uh, fourth wife, which I'm not going to get into here. Um, but once Thomas Cromwell is executed. Um, Wyatt is is out of favor with the king, and he's recalled from this uh, from this mission in Spain. He is granted the site and estates of Boxley Abbey in 1540. Um, this was a way of of um, showing the king's. Um, the restoration of the king's favor, I guess, around 1540. The King Henry VIII appears very fickle. Sometimes he likes Wyatt and sometimes he doesn't. In 1540, he gives him all this land that had been confiscated when King Henry VIII dissolved um, uh, the, the various monastic institutions in England when he broke away from the Catholic Church. So some of those lands went to Wyatt. But... In 1541, he's imprisoned again for treason. Uh, this time, he is spared by the intercession of the king's fifth wife, Catherine Howard, who was a cousin of the Earl of Surrey, Henry Howard, whom we're going to talk about in a minute. So he dies one year later. Um, of not not of he was not executed. He he dies uh, after an illness at the age of 39, and uh, Surrey would write a, a wonderful uh, epitaph in rhymed quatrains um, called Wyatt Resteth Here, and it's an enormous praise for Wyatt as a man, as a poet, um, says that he's, he's the new Chaucer for England in that poem. So now we'll talk about Surrey. He was born to Thomas Howard and Elizabeth Stafford. Both of his parents had could trace their family trees back to, to early uh, kings, Anglo-Saxon kings. Um, his mother, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Stafford, was a descendant of King Edward III, Chaucer's patron, and he was raised up at Windsor Castle with King Henry VIII's illegitimate son, Henry Fitzroy, who was born in 1519. And Fitzroy later became the Duke of Richmond and Somerset. There he is. Not a particularly flattering portrait compared to the portraits of Holbein. Um, his time at Windsor Castle with Fitzroy would be remembered in a, a, a wonderful poem uh, <clears throat> called So Cruel Prison, where he talks about his childhood at Windsor Castle with with Fitzroy. In 1524, he receives the title uh, of Earl of Surrey when his father becomes the third Duke of Norfolk. And I, I, I refer to Henry Howard as Surrey. In 1532, he travels with King Henry VIII, Fitzroy, and his cousin, Anne Boleyn, uh, who's now Henry VIII's second wife, to France. He stays there for about a year or so. In 1533, Henry VIII's illegitimate son, Fitzroy, marries Surrey's sister, Mary. So that makes Fitzroy Surrey's brother-in-law. In 1536, Anne Boleyn is executed. Uh, again, that's an event that... that may have been witnessed by uh, Thomas Wyatt while he was in prison in the Tower of London. Also in this year, uh, Fitzroy passes away um, of uh, disease, some kind of pulmonary disease. 
Uh, he was only 17 years old, I think, at the time. And this is, a, this is uh, an event that um, affected Surrey profoundly. And when he wrote his poem, uh, So Cruel Prison, uh, about a year later, he was, um, he was a bit of a hellraiser and he got in a fight. And so he was put under a kind of house arrest at Windsor Castle. And that's what the poem's about. And while he's there, he's also grieving uh, the death of Fitzroy as he remembers their, um, their, their time together as children and young men at Windsor Castle. Also in 1536, uh, he travels with his father to Yorkshire, the north of England, to suppress a major Catholic revolt up there that was known as the Pilgrimage of Grace. In 1537, the king's third wife, Jane Seymour, dies after, she does not get her head cut off, but she dies after giving birth to King Henry VIII's first legitimate male heir, the future Edward VI. And this is important. You'll see why in a moment. In 1540, Surrey's cousin, Catherine Howard, now this is Surrey's second cousin to marry King Henry VIII, Catherine Howard uh, becomes his fifth wife, King Henry VIII's fifth wife, and it's through her influence that he was able to secure the pardon for Sir Thomas, Thomas Wyatt in 1541. However, her head would get cut off. Uh, the second, she was the second of Surrey's relations to be executed, Anne Boleyn being the first, and in 1547, um, Surrey uh, basically shows his dissatisfaction with family politics in the Tudor court, and he starts bearing the arms of his Anglo-Saxon ancestor, Edward the Confessor. The king, uh, very paranoid and ill at the time, suspects that Surrey was plotting to usurp the throne from his son, Edward, and he orders Surrey's execution, and Surrey is beheaded on January the 19th, 1547. Uh, just nine days later, Henry VIII dies, and his son, nine-year-old Edward, is crowned. So both Wyatt and Surrey wind up imprisoned in the Tower of London. In 1554, um, part of Surrey's translation of Virgil's Aeneid, this is a, a Latin epic poem, uh, was published. And this is significant because uh, Surrey translated it in blank verse, which is unrhymed iambic pentameter. And that would become the, the meter um, of uh, British epic poetry. Later, so this is a significant innovation in British poetry: unrhymed iambic pentameter or blank verse. In 1557, the London printer Richard Tottle publishes an important collection of poems called Songs and Sonnets. It's also known as Tottle's Miscellany. This was an important collection of short lyrics composed by various Renaissance courtiers. But the poems of Wyatt and Surrey make up over half of it. So it's, it's, it's where a lot of Wyatt and Surrey's poems appear in print for the first time. So a significant um, moment in the history of English poetry, the publication of this book. So now we're going to talk about the sonnet. Um, because Surrey and Wyatt wrote so many of them. So the sonnet is a lyric poem. So a, a lot of the poems that we've been reading up to this point uh, are narrative poems. That is, they're poems that tell stories. But lyric poems are different. They're poems about feelings. Um, they're, they're poems about interiority, about what's going on in, in the poet's mind. Uh, the sonnet is, is, is a form of lyric poem. Um, that typically consists of 14 lines. The two most common forms of sonnets are the Italian sonnet and the English sonnet. We're going to talk a lot about the differences between these two 
in a moment. Um, but as the name suggests, Italian sonnets originated in 14th century Italy. They were written by vernacular poets like Dante Alighieri and Francesco Pet Petrarca or Petrarch. Um, Petrarch really thought of himself as a Latin poet, um, but he was writing um, these these lyric poems on the side as a as a kind of as a kind of pastime in the Italian vernacular, and and these are the poems for which he's most famous today, and not the Latin poems that he was so proud of. Another common name for the Italian sonnet is the Petrarchan sonnet. In Petrarch's collection of poems, the uh, that, that I told you he was writing about, sort of sort of on the side as he was working on these these more ambitious Latin poems. Uh, it's called the Rima Sparsa, and it consists of 366 poems. And, and, and of those 366 poems, 317 are sonnets. And all of these poems express his unrequited love for a married woman, a woman he, he really didn't have much personal interaction with, named Lara. So the Italian sonnet was introduced to the English-speaking world by Wyatt and Surrey. Uh, they translated uh, or, or adapted a number of Petrarch sonnets. Um, and although their sonnets circulated primarily in manuscript, as I said before, and didn't appear in print until Tottle published Songs and Sonnets, um, which was long after um, both men were dead, by the way. I think, I think uh, Surrey had been dead for 10 years when Songs and Sonnets was published. Um, and uh, Wyatt for longer than that. But uh, they, they are credited with introducing the Italian sonnet, and they, they wrote sonnets of their own. Um, Wyatt's sonnet, uh, Diverse Death Use, that, that, that is uh, um, an original sonnet, not a, not a translation of Petrarch, but a large number of their sonnets are uh, translations or adaptations of Petrarch. So as in the Italian tradition, English Renaissance sonnets deal primarily with sexual attraction, love, courtship, and sometimes marriage. Oftentimes, these things are very difficult for the poet. Um, I wouldn't say that all sonnets are about these things. Um, for example, a Surrey sonnet, uh, The Syrian's King, is, is not specifically about the poet's uh, feelings of love towards a woman, but a lot of the sonnets are about romantic uh, relationships. Um, it is unlikely that these sonnets represent completely authentic romantic relationships. Uh, we shouldn't assume that the, the speakers in these poems are speaking about specific women, like a specific woman that Wyatt or, or Surrey had in mind. Um, <clears throat> but by the end of the 16th century, it became fashionable for poets to compose sonnets in long sequences. You know, it's like, a, like sometimes over a hundred uh, sonnets. And the sonnets record the fluctuating moods and affections of the poet and his beloved over time. You know, sometimes um, he might be really um, overflowing with feelings, positive feelings. And at times uh, he may be feeling completely dejected. Um, famous sequences were written by Philip Sidney, Astrophil and Stella. We'll be, we'll be looking at, at some of these uh, sequences next. Edmund Spencer had one called the Amoretti. Samuel Drayton, Ideas Mirror. William Shakespeare uh, wrote a large number of sonnets. Remember today for their irony and playfulness, we'll also be looking at some of those sonnets as well. I would not say that the poems of Wyatt and Surrey are exclusively sonnets. Uh, we do have a few examples uh, that we're reading of, of uh, poems, lyric poems and forms that are not sonnets. Uh, one that's coming to mind is uh, Wyatt's poem, They Flee From Me, um, which is an older, uh, not a sonnet, and in an older Middle English form that was used by Chaucer called Rhyme Royal, which, which is uh, a seven-line stanza, Rhyme Royal. So the Italian form of the sonnet is structured as two quatrains or two four-line sections that together are called the octave. And these uh, consistently rhyme A, B, B, A, 
A, B, B, A. And that octave is then followed by two tercets or three line sections that together are called a sestet. So this octave sestet form is then Italian form. And those tercets most often rhyme C, D, E, C, D, E, or C, D, C, C, D, C. And because of the number of rhymed words required in the Italian form, so you got to have four A rhymes and four B rhymes, and depending on the form of the sestet, four C rhymes, this, this presents, Italian is easier to rhyme than English, so this presents significant challenges for poets writing in English. So the English sonnet um, solves this problem structurally. So it consists of uh, three quatrains, uh, rather than the octave sestet form, um, with alternating rhyming lines. So, for example, the first quatrain might rhyme A, B, A, B, the next one C, D, C, D, and the third one E, F, E, F. English sonnets, however, always close with a couplet, so two consecutive rhyming lines at the end. So the result is, is that the English sonnet contains a greater variety of rhyming sounds than the Italian sonnet. English sonnets are usually written in iambic pentameter. So we're going to look at the difference between the Italian and the English sonnet by looking actually at translations of one of Petrarch's sonnets. Uh, poem number 167 in the Rima Sparsa. So on the left, I'm going to show you the Italian form. You might pause the video for a moment so you can read this poem. And I'm going to show you the Italian structure. So here is the A, B, B, A rhyme scheme. Um, that third line, melody, would be pronounced melody to, to rhyme with sigh. And this is the first quatrain. And then we have the second quatrain, which also rhymes A, B, B, A. And then we have the first tercet of the sestet, C, D, E. And then the second one, C, D, E. So on the right side, I'm going to put up the the English form. Now this is the same sonnet translated into English by a different writer. Um, I think, uh, gosh, I can't remember if this translation is older or, or, or more recent. Um, all, both of these are 19th century. These are not 20th century or 21st century translations. But this one and this translation on the right, the translator put it into um, something closer to the form of the English sonnet. So curiously, the first two quatrains um, rhyme the same way the Italian form does. A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A. The difference is here in the third quatrain. So instead of a sestet with two tercets, we have a third quatrain that rhymes C, D, C, D. And then it ends with a couplet, E, E. So that is an illustration of the difference between the Italian and the English sonnet forms. There is, in, in most sonnets, a, a poignant moment uh, where the speaker moves from a problem or, or an observation stated at the beginning of the sonnet and moves towards a resolution that's presented in the conclusion. Uh, and this usually happens right around the, the uh, change from the octave to the sestet or from the first two quatrains to the third quatrain in an English sonnet. And this turning point is called the volta. And it's usually signaled by a perceptible change in tone, imagery, um, or subject matter. So it might go from description in the first two quatrains to reflection in the third quatrain and couplet, for example. So I'm going to give you an example of a sonnet on the left here. You might pause and read it. This one's by Samuel Daniel. This is from a sequence called Delia, and this is number 33, sonnet number 33 in that sequence. 
So the Volta often appears around the ninth line. I put an arrow there. That is um, line number nine. The world shall find this miracle in me. It's usually where the Volta will, will, will fit. Sometimes it might not appear until the final couplet. But in this example, the Volta, I would say, appears here. So in the first part of the poem, in those first two quatrains, um, or the octave, um, Daniel is, is or, 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 or the speaker, the persona of, this, of the sequence, is talking about um, the, um, uh, the beloved woman getting older and um, uh, and that, that she can see the wounds that she has caused him. She has made him suffer throughout their relationship. Um, and that even though she gets older, his, his wounds remain fresh. Um, the Volta then that starts the world shall find this miracle in me changes the direction of the poem uh, pretty significantly because it goes from um, a, a description of her um, and and talking about um, how she has uh, made him feel uh, to talking about her feelings so in in the last six lines of the poem the third quatrain in the couplet he talks about how she might how he imagines her uh, responding to the events of their relationship and the pain that she has caused him. Um, he says, the world shall find this miracle in me that fire can burn when all the matter is spent. So my love for you never died, even though you got older and even though you did not um, requite my, my feelings for you. And then he says, what my faith hath been thyself shall see and that thou wast unkind, thou mayst repent. So he imagines her here after the Volta, after the turn in the poem. He's imagining how she's going to respond and how she's going to feel. And um, he imagines that, that she will regret what she has done uh, now that she's older and alone, that she will repent her um, treatment of him. And that's basically the message of the couplet as well. Thou mayst repent that thou hast scorned my tears when winter snows upon thy golden hairs. So... As you get old, you're going to regret what you've done to me when you were young. So this is an example of um, the shift from the first part of a sonnet to the second part, um, which we call the, the Volta. And one of the challenges of reading sonnets is identifying that specific moment of change. So there are some questions for you to think about as you read the sonnets. Um, of Wyatt and Surrey. How do the personae in the sonnets, how do the, 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 the speakers in these poems um, portray the experience of being in love? What is, what is it like to be in love? What makes it pleasant? What makes it unpleasant? What are the challenges that lovers experience? Another, another way of thinking about it is to ask how they treat the object of their affections. If you were the recipient of the message, imagine that you were receiving these poems. How would you receive it? How would you feel about it? And then identify what you think is the volta in each sonnet, the turning point. Look for a shift in message or emphasis. And how does it clarify or complicate the overall meaning of the poem? And that concludes the presentation on Wyatt, Surrey, and the English sonnet.